you listen carefully to the words, one of the themes that the song really, really centered around is the very uncomfortable potential for us to live our lives and squander them. Uh, we live in an age of scams, you know, almost every day we get a, each of us gets hundreds of things, uh, you know, that are just bogus. They're challenging us, tempting us to misinvest some of our finances, you know, like how many have ever seen the one, the guy, uh, somebody in Africa that you, you're going to, they're going to send you millions of dollars if you, of course, put some money up. So there, there's all these scams out there today. But you know, you think about it, with all the financial scams in existence today, the worst that anyone loses, um, and I'm not going to ask you if you've ever fallen for any of them, uh, the worst that you lose is you misinvest a little bit of your money. But if you misinvest your life, and I, I'm convinced, based on what Jesus says in his word, that multitudes of human beings are absolutely squandering their lives, absolutely misinvesting our lives. And that's it. That's all we have. Missing the very purpose for our existence. That's the worst scam imaginable. When we come to this season each year in our church, uh, Kim introduced it wonderfully last week. We call it our 5C series, and I'll unpack that again. But what we really have come to believe based on Scripture is that there are five irreducible minimums for a human being to be fully human and fully alive the way that God intended, not the way society considers normal. But if you really believe Scripture, there are five irreducible minimums. Um, Kim talked about them, and I'll, I'll just present them to you right now. The Scripture indicates that it is absolutely necessary for a human being going through this journey in life, if he's to be what God intended, to connect with Christ through Christ's community, to build real relationships with those that are connected or followers of Christ. The Scripture teaches that every human being that's going to fulfill God's purpose and design for this journey should be intentionally and constantly throughout life seeking to cultivate Christ-like character development. It will not happen automatically. It takes intentionality and cultivation. Each and every human, thirdly, needs to be endlessly devoted to caring for others through ministry or through service. That's the design of God, that we are to be trained and disciplined and learn in this life. Uh, the universal necessity that I'll talk about later on a little bit more of servanthood. That's not up for grabs. That's not up for options if you and I want to fulfill God's design for our existence. The fourth one is contributing to the expansion of God's kingdom. In this world of ours, it means contributing of our finances. Listen, God designs that we would wear his image, that we would be generous givers. God is the greatest giver in the universe. We will not fulfill the role he intended unless we are developing in that area. And then God calls each of us to be those that communicate his message, communicate his truth, tell others about who he is and what he's like and his worthiness. We will do this for eternity. We will forever communicate the message and the truth about God. These are five irreducible minimums. Now, our temptation, uh, I've been around long enough to know this, our temptation as human beings is to pick and choose. Well, you know, I will do this one, I'll seek to develop in this one, but I'll ignore that one because that one's just a little bit more uncomfortable. And what I'm here to tell you is if you, if you care at all about the truth, God's word is crystal clear. You and I cannot live a God-pleasing life. We will absolutely squander our life if we are not eagerly developing in all five of these areas. They were irreducible minimums. You can't, I'm going to try to say, you can't be a healthy human being or Christian unless you're developing in all those five areas. Let me go further. No church, no church on earth can be healthy and effective and pleasing to God unless it is also always developing in those five areas. Irreducible minimums. Kim also did a great job last week of explaining that when Jesus said, Many, many years ago, over 2,000 years ago, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. That Jesus was talking about an assembly that God would call out. The scripture teaches that the purpose for this life centers in this thing called the church that Jesus is building. Now, this, this runs really contrary to what the vast majority of people believe. I mean, if we were to, you know, survey, you've heard me say this before, the masses of people, and say, what's your purpose for life? It'd be like, well, your purpose 
is whatever you determine it to be. You know, you've got yours, I've got mine, but that's not what the Scripture says. The Scripture says that we are here for Christ and that apart from Him, we never find the real reason for our existence. This journey is meant to be a developmental journey where as human beings, free moral agents, we learn to put our faith in Christ, submit joyfully to His loving leadership, and then develop and grow to be like him. God has intended that he's going to populate the universe with humans and angels that joyfully trust and submit to the loving lordship and goodness of Christ. There is a sifting mechanism going on. The scripture teaches that as the message of Christ goes out, God is sifting humanity. Let's be frank about this. He's frank about it in his word. He knows that all things considered, there are multitudes of human beings that will simply choose all things considered, I want to be the captain of my own destiny. I want to live my few years, however many there may be, doing what I want to do, when I want to do it, the way I want to do it. I, I know this Christ thing might work for you, but I don't really care about it for me. I'm not interested. I don't need it or I don't want it. And God understands that, but he says that he's sifting humanity because that really, really uh, exposes the deeper troubling condition of a human being's heart when they can look at pure goodness pure love, pure righteousness, pure kindness, the offer of forgiveness and eternal life, and say, you know, all things considered, I'm not too interested in that. I just want to be the captain of my own fate. So Scripture says this organism called the church, the called out assembly, the body of Christ in its functionality, the family of God in its relational capacity, that it's the most important thing happening on the planet, that all through time, this is God's program, this is his design, this is where he's taking and sifting humanity and determining who will populate eternity, who will be given the capacity to be completely transformed to the image of Christ and inhabit the immortal family of God. Uh, God says it's not what's going on at the UN or it's not what's going on in the entertainment world or the sports world or the art world or any other philosophical world that is the most important thing happening on the planet. He says categorically the church, the body of Christ, the gathering of believers is the most important thing happening on the planet. Therefore, if we care about what God says the purpose for life is, we will have a very different picture of this thing called church than what I think is typical. I mean, it, you know, we, we grew up in American society, and I think that American society uh, well-meaningly has sort of distorted what the church is like. Let's face it. If we were to get a bunch of people in a room, a couple hundred people, and say, okay, what, what's the deal? What's the church? They'd say, well, you know, church is a, a place uh, where some people gather that want to worship God and sing some songs about God and prepare for life after death, and they usually have a little building and might have a steeple or something like that, and they're people that like to do good. And here's the thing that would always be present in a statement like that. Essentially, this is optional. You know, these people, there's nothing wrong with it. doesn't hurt anybody. They like to do that. And so church is cool for them. They, they may need it. They're weaker, maybe. They, they, they need it. But it's optional at best. And, and so the church is kind of depicted as this little innocuous, trite little group of do-gooders that, that, you know, you can take it or leave it. There's lots of other options as to how you live your life or what the real meaning and purpose of life is. But that is not what the scripture teaches. And I think that it muddies and cloudies our view so that we unconsciously at times uh, consider a little less important what goes on in a local church than what God does. And when we feel that it's a little less important, it's only natural that we're not going to be as, as committed to it because we're committed to things that we're convinced are really important. And so we have to really kind of reframe uh, the way we look at this thing that Jesus called the church that he is building, this called out assembly that's being called out all through time. And if you've put your faith and trust in Christ and become his follower, you are a part of the church that functionally is the body of Christ, relationally is the family of God. And so Jesus intends us to develop in this context to become fully human and fully alive the way God intended in this context of the church. And that's where the five C's come in. They are the, the pillars. They are the foundations for the kind of developmental journey that God intends for every human being to take. Now today, uh, I'm dealing with the C that, that deals with caring. Caring for others through ministry. Or if you want to change that word ministry to service. Caring for others through service. 
And again, it is an irreducible minimum. It is not something that you and I can pick and choose whether or not to participate if, if we're a real Christian. Now, in your body and in my body this morning, there is somewhere between 50 and 75 trillion cells alive and at work. And if you don't believe me, just count them. Count them on your own sometime. But this is what they say, and they are experts at everything. They, they, whoever they are, they know everything. But they say there are some 50 to 75 trillion cells in your body and my body. And here's what's interesting. This is what those cells, the 50 to 75 trillion, all have in common. Every single one of these cells. There's a few things. Number one, they are all active. They are all working. They are all serving Every one of them. Every one of them. And they're all serving you or me. I mean, 75 trillion cells, they're all just utterly surrendered and dedicated to you, to me, to allowing you and I to express ourselves and live the way we want, to assert our will. All these cells, their function. Now, the only, the only uh, way that this is not occurring is if some of the cells in your body or mind become diseased, Okay? Or die. And cells do die off. They say that, you know, roughly around every seven years, you get a whole different set. Now, this doesn't work like every seven years, whole new you. They, they die and come to life at different times. New ones are being produced. But how many of you know that the, the second set of sevens and the third and the fourth and the fifth, the, the, the later you go, the worse set you get? How many, how, many, <laughs> how many know that? Yeah. Doesn't get better. Till the resurrection. That's where Christ and his power over uh, sin, sorrow, sickness, and death comes in. But... Here's the thing, in your body, in my body, there are organs that are made by these cells. You know, your, your heart is made by a bunch of cells and your eyes are made by different ones. The cells all are actively working, tirelessly working. They continue to serve you and to serve me until they become diseased or they die. Okay, but they're actively serving. And they have different functions and they cluster together in different places, but... Every function is important if your body is going to be fully alive, right? I mean, you know, I've never, as important as this, I have never seen my liver. Have you, have you seen your liver? Have you ever seen your kidney? No. Have you ever seen your heart? No. But would we all agree it's important? Yes. Yeah, the answer to that is yes. <laughs> you know, so the functional members of our body sometimes that are so important don't get a lot of limelight. Um, so it is, we'll see, in the body of Christ. So, I'm talking about this activity of cells and organs because that's the picture of membership that is given in the scriptures. One of the things, and, and bear with me, I don't want to, if this happened to hit you, um, but, uh, you know, it's just something I feel very aggravated about through my years. I'm, allow- I'm getting older now. I'm allowed to be a little cranky. And, uh, but occasionally, I hear people say things like, well, the New Testament doesn't teach membership anywhere. That's just something the church has made up. And I just want to scream at that kind of ignorance. It absolutely teaches membership. What it does not teach is this American model of membership that we have unconsciously embraced. You know, where you kind of, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm joining the church, and your name gets signed on a roll, and you can never even show up in the church for the next 20 years, and you're still a member of the church. In fact, you can even die and be a member of the church in some churches. That's not the way the Scripture uses the word member. It does use it in the way that I have been alluding to, a physical member of the body of Christ. Christ is the head, the brain. He calls the shots. We are his hands, his feet, his organs, his heart, his mouth. We are members of Christ's body and members of one another. That's a far more highly committed membership. Remember what I said. Every cell in your body is working constantly, lest it's diseased or dying. Every organ of your body is working constantly, committed to you, surrendered to you, unless it's diseased or dying. That's the way Scripture uses membership. And every Christian, everyone that's actually put faith in Christ and decided to follow him is a member of his body, albeit Some are not participating members. Some are diseased members. And some are dead members, spiritually speaking. So what I want to do with the rest of this time is I want to try to expand 
your view on this subject of caring for others uh, through ministry or caring for others through service, caring for others the way that Christ does. And then I want to hopefully get you to see before this, this talk is over that the way that you and I, one of the ways you and I grow to be more Christ-like, one of the ways that we can grow in virtue, and by virtue I mean Christ-like character development, it is through serving and won't happen, won't happen unless we are serving. It's normal for a member in your body to serve. Remember that, unless it's diseased or it's dead. So it is in Christ. We are members, participating members of his body. And that's why we have these five C's, because every cell in our body is contributing to our life. Well, we become contributing, participating members when we function in each of these five areas. Not one, not two, not three, not even four, but five, all five. It's just the same, and I think Kim alluded to this last week. You know, you and I know that we need to breathe to live, and we need to drink water to live, and we need to eat food to live, and we need to sleep to live, and we need to move to live. These are five irreducible minimums. You can't take any of the five away without it leading to deterioration and ultimately death. So it is with these five C's that we talk about. All right. Caring for others like Christ. If you don't mind turning in your Bible to page 1158, and then I don't know the other page number, so if someone could shout it out for me, but it's in uh, the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, and unfortunately we have two different numbers. I don't know how that happened, but 1158 will be one. But what is the other one? If somebody gets... 828. 1158 or 828. And we're in the book of Ephesians. And I'm going to start in chapter uh, 4, verse 1, but you know, I'm going to jump you around a bit. But go ahead and just get yourself located there. As you're turning there, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to believers living in the city of Ephesus. He had planted a church there and then left, and he's actually in jail for the cause of Christ as he's writing this letter back to them. And uh, you, you see that he, he appears to be like anything but a prisoner, even though he was in jail for his faith in Christ. All right, starting in verse 1. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Well, how do we do that, Paul? Verse 2. Be completely, what does it say? Humble and gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another, which shows that we're going to get on each other's nerves occasionally. Bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit the bond of peace, which shows that unity in a local church takes effort, you know, uh, we, we, we can get, you know, on one another's nerves and so forth. Now, drop down, if you would, to verse 7. It says, to each one of us, grace, unmerited mercy, and favors, what grace means, has been given as Christ or as the Messiah apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train. Train there is not like, doot, doot. It's like, you know, flowing gown train. He led captives in his train. And he gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions or dimensions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. The word fill has the idea of governing influence. You, you can see that in Ephesians 5 verse 18. Sometime on your own, figure that out. Verse 11. Now this is where I really was trying to get you to. It was he who gave some, here's these, these gifted leaders that he gives to every church or, or has given through time. Not all the offices are, always have to be functional, necessarily. It was he who gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets and some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers. Okay, here's this leadership team, but what is it that they're supposed to do? Verse 12, now this is where I want you to kind of work with me. To prepare who? So this leadership team's job is to prepare who? God's people, for what? Works of what? Service. Service. Why? So that the body of Christ may be built up. Let me read it to you again. I, I'll, I'll do This leadership team's job is to prepare or equip God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. The body of Christ is built up as new people come to put their faith in Christ and become his follower. They become members of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is built up as those new followers of Christ grow in virtue or Christ-like character development. Uh, that's how the body of Christ is built up. It grows. Look at verse 13, and it continues the thought. This process is going to go on how long? You tell me. Until we 
all reach the unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God become what? Mature. But, but what is maturity? Go, go get, you can do this. It, sa it says it right there in the text. It tells you what, what maturity is. Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. It means that this process of God is going to go on until all the believing family becomes fully character, character-wise like Christ. That's maturity. That's spiritual maturity. Jesus is, is the standard. He's what you and I are going to be when we grow up, is what that's saying. Let me go on. It says, then, you know, when we get mature, uh, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in what? I, I get tired of people that, you know, pride themselves. You know, well, I tell you, I just tell it like it is. I just say it right from the shoulder. You, know, you don't have to wonder what I'm thinking. I'll tell you what I think of you. I just speak the truth. Well, you just need to shut up. <laughs> It says, speak the truth, how? In love. And verse 29 explains a little bit about love. It says, it says this. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is what? Helpful for building others up according to our needs, their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So, you know, this stuff about I just speak the truth. I, I've just seen so many insensitive, rude Christians pride themselves on that when they should be ashamed. We are to speak the truth in love, which calls for some thought about the need of those that uh, we're, we're speaking to. Anyway, another message. Um, let, me, let me go on. Instead, speaking truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, you know, Christ is the head of the body, we're his hands and feet and so forth, who is Christ. From him, meaning Christ, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love, but it only happens, the body only grows and builds itself up in love as what? As what? As each part does its work. Now, let's retrace our steps a bit. Verse 12. The leadership team's job is to prepare God's people for works of service. Therefore, what it's saying is if you and I are God's people, if we have put our faith and trust in Christ, if we belong to the family of God, then each and every one of us is designed and created and power is given us by the, the Spirit of God to serve. Every single believer is a servant and we will serve in this life and we will serve for all eternity because Jesus is our Lord, He is the head, and he's the greatest servant in the universe. Now, you've got to ask yourself a question. Are you a member of God's family, first of all? And, and, and this is not casual. I, I, I mean, sometimes people think it's casual. It's like, oh, you know, me and them dude upstairs, we got an agreement. You know, he knows me, he knows me. Oh, if you think that way, I assure you, you don't know him. Because you would never speak that way. You would have far more reverence than to ever speak about the living God that way. It can't be casual when someone dies for you. Jesus died for us. And so, are you a child of God? Which means this. Have you really put your faith in Christ? Have you made the decision, I don't care what the rest of the world does. I believe Christ is trustworthy. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose from the grave. I believe this is his universe and he's coming again. And I will serve him for my whole life joyfully, even if nobody else does. Because I trust him. I'm going to follow him fully forever. Have you made that decision? If you have, you are a child of God. If you have not, you are not a child of God. You do not have forgiveness of sins. You do not possess eternal life. But you can have it today before you leave. If you'll choose to put your faith in Christ. I hope you make that decision if you haven't. But then if you're a child of God... You have to answer the second question, are you serving? Because it is, it is the design and the intention and the eternal purpose of God that all of his children be servants. It says right there, as each part does its work, the body of Christ grows. The, team, the leadership team's job is to get every child of God to be serving. And so you must answer, if you're a child of God, are you serving? And if you're not, 
Why not? Because we said in our human bodies, the only reason that a cell isn't serving is when it's diseased or it's dying or dead. So if you're a child of God and you're not serving, is it maybe because you're diseased spiritually or dead, spiritually speaking? Now there's, a, there's grace from God to heal the sickness that may be in you today that keeps you from serving. It may be an attitude disease. Um, or even to bring you to life again spiritually. There's grace for that. So, this passage is crystal clear that it is the design of God for every one of his children to be servants in this world and after this world uh, continues. Now, I want to just stretch you a bit and, and expand your view of, of serving, and I hope that it will uh, give you a, a, a way to see serving in a more noble light. Listen to what it says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 about Christ. It says, your attitude, meaning mine and yours, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus or Messiah Jesus, who being in very nature, who? God. Jesus is God. Make no mistake about that. Did not consider equality with God, meaning the Father, something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a what? A servant. This takes all service and elevates it with a universal, eternal nobility. Listen, there is no service that if you're a child of God, there's no service you do, no matter how hidden, doesn't matter if you're appreciated or, or not appreciated, it, it just doesn't matter if it's seen or not seen. There's no service that is not noble, that is not significant to God, that will not have eternal repercussions and that you will not be rewarded for if it's done in the spirit. And I'm going to unpack that later and not done in the flesh. And I'll unpack that later. But this is a grand opportunity. Jesus elevates servanthood of every sort uh, forever. The universe is to be inhabited by those that are eternal servants of one another. Listen to what it says in Matthew 20. Jesus you know, dealt with this issue head on when his disciples were fighting for positions of authority. He said, whoever wants to be great among you must be your what? Servant. We know that. We know the greater serves the lesser. How many of you have dogs? Let me see your hands. Dog people. All right. I'm not trying to be crude. How many of you go around behind your dog and pick up its poop? All right. How many of you feed your dog? Let me see your hands. How many of you pet your dog and rub it and tickle it and play with it? Yeah. Are you scared of that dog? Is that why you do it? Is that dog superior to you because he's not picking up your poop? <laughs> I mean, if, you know, from, from an alien looking down, you know, it'd be like, whoa, man, those dogs are superior creatures. Uh, these people are going around in little bags and what have you. No. And, and you ever think about it? What do we ask of the dogs? Just to love us a little, you know? Just to cuddle up, you know, and let us scratch them and so forth. The greater serves the lesser. It, it, it's always so. How, how many of you have kids? How many of you have, have, uh, have children? Let's see your hands. Remember when they were babies? Okay. When they were babies, they're, they're pretty limited in what they can do. And, and, and just think back at that time when they were still babies, still in diapers and so forth. And let's just say someone asked you, this day is all yours today. You have 24 hours just to, just to do whatever you want. It's your day. Could you imagine some parents saying, well, I know what I want to do today. I would, I would love to change maybe 12, maybe 16 soil diapers. I, I would just love to do that. And, and maybe if I'm really fortunate, I can get a little vomit on two or three outfits. And, 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 on a, and oh, it would make my day if I get to hear maybe two, three hours of crying. That, that's what I really, really love to do. No. No. But you do it. Why? Because the greater serves the lesser, and you just do it for love. You do, listen to me carefully, you do inconvenient service. How many, how many agree it's pretty inconvenient to mess with a really, really messed up diaper? That, there's nothing fun or convenient about it. How many, how many would just say, that is not fun? I would not choose to do that. We had a guy in the first service that, you know, there's always one weirdo, raised his hand, <laughs> said, uh, <laughs> said he likes doing it. I'm like, eh, I don't want to go there, man. Don't even want to know. That's enough information. <laughs> So, serving, 
Serving has eternal repercussions, and the greater always serves the lesser or the weaker. This is what it says in Romans 8, 29, to show you how this image-bearing component of, of the servanthood of Christ is going to be a part of us and is a part of us even now. You want to find your real self? Your real self is a servant. In Romans 8, 29, it says this, for those God foreknew, in other words, God foreknew, he looked down through the tunnel of time, and he knew ahead of time who would put their faith in Christ and repent and who would reject his grace forever. He foreknew, and those that he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed or transformed. In other words, those that put faith in Christ, God predestined, he's going to do his work in them to transform them fully to the image of his son, conform to the likeness of his son, meaning you and I are going to be transformed to the image of Christ someday. Why? That he might be the firstborn among many brothers. God's going to inhabit the universe with humans and angels that are Christ-like in character. That's what the future holds. There will be no other free moral agents in the universe other than those that are joyfully submitted to Christ and that are like Christ in heart and in soul. Listen to what it says in, in the book of Ephesians 2.15. This is really a key one. It says, his purpose, meaning the purpose of God, was to create in himself, in Christ that is, what does it say? One new man. The word man there in the original language in the Greek is anthropos. And what it really could be translated is God's purpose was to create in Christ one new humanity, a whole new human race, a whole new kind of human, Christ-like humans. And Christ is the eternal servant, and therefore, if we're going to be conformed to his image, we are going to be spontaneous, joyful, eternal service. The universe is going to be inhabited by beings that just look for opportunities to serve one another and never even think about being used or abused in the process. And the training, the training for this happens now in this life. And it's more important that you and I learn to be servants than nearly anything else we'll learn in this life. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, it just says, Now, right now, we are the body of Christ, and each one of us is a part of it. Ephesians 1, 22, it says, God placed all things under his feet, meaning Jesus, and appointed him to be the head, the head over the body, you know, our heads control the use of our body, the head over everything for the what? The church, which is his what? His functional body during this present age. The fullness of of him who fills everything in every way. You know what that's saying? It's saying that God's going to take your unique personality and your unique personality and my unique personality, transform me to Christ-likeness, but I'm always still going to be Randy, and you're always still going to be you, and that this manif manifestation of all these different personalities expresses to the universe um, differing aspects of the beauty of Christ. Your, your unique uh, personality is always going to be preserved, but purified to be Christ-like, and the whole universe will be full of the glory of Christ as it's manifested in his many-membered body of which you are a part. So I hope that this has expanded and stretched your view of serving. It is just not something that you kind of do if you want, or it's just something sort of dutiful. It is a key part of your purpose for being alive on this planet. We are here to learn to be servants, servants, because that's what the universe is going to be ultimately forever, a group of servants. Now, sometimes uh, I meet people and they say things like, yeah, you know, Randy, I, I just keep looking, you know, I, I know that God's got something special for me to do, and I just keep wondering what it is, and I keep looking, and, and gee, you know, it's just not coming, and I, and I can't find my niche, and I just know it's there somewhere, and I keep, I keep wondering and looking, and, and, and they never seem to find it. They're, they're, they're waiting. They don't want to just, you know, they don't want to waste their energy. They don't wanna, they, they're waiting for that certain thing then they want to just really jump into it in a blaze. It's kind of like the martyr complex. It's like they want to do something really great for God, really big. And what they miss is that you'll never do anything great for God unless you do what's right in front of you right now. And it's probably pretty small in our sight, but not in God's. So a good preacher named Fred Craddock, and he was addressing a group of ministers, and he said something about this complex. It says, you know, we all kind of want to go out in a blaze of light. We want to just kind of lay our life in some great sacrifice and be remembered forever, you know, a martyrdom or something like that. It's kind of like we want to have a, a $10,000 check and just lay it all on the altar and say, let, you know, let it be used for your glory, God. 
But Craddock says what God does is he says, take the $10,000 and put it into quarters, 25 cent pieces, $10,000 worth, and, and serve me 25 cents at a time. And if we don't serve 25 cents at a time, the little things right in front of us, we never find that niche, that place of maximum effectiveness. Now, there is a place where your personality and your temperament and your experiences and your talents and your spiritual gifts, they all come into sort of this, this flow where you're just sort of an automatic pilot and, and you're, you're really, really uh, uh, an effective functional minister in the body of Christ, but you never get there. Trust me on this. I'm, I'm an old dude now. I know this. You never get there unless you humbly serve right where you're at. Do what you can do right in front of you. And it's not always going to be convenient. And it's not always going to feel, you know, real um, exciting and that sort of thing. The nature of servanthood is just that way. But if we start to serve where we're at, we will find that it expands our virtue, it changes us. It changes our character. Let me give you an example. Um, let's take two people. One person <clears throat> does an awful lot of reading about exercise and healthy diet. They read and read and read. They're, they're experts. If you ask them a question about exercise or diet, they can just encyclopedically rattle it off to you. But, but, they never actually exercise themselves nor do they follow the healthy diet that they know so much about. All right, then you have another person. They don't really know much at all about uh, exercise or healthy diet, but they go to a gym, and they talk to people that know a little bit more than them, and they just do it. They just start exercising, and they just start eating the way that other people tell them. Now, at the end of three years... Who's going to be better off, the knowledge expert with their big brain exploding with information or the, the simple person that just did it? We all know the answer. You see, listen, this is the key to this. As we do, as we do, we develop. You cannot develop, I cannot develop without doing. Does that make sense to you? You can study something, study it, you can think about it, you can pray about it, you can do all those things. You will not develop. We will still stay the same. There is a development of Christ-like character and virtue that will never start to really rise up in you or me. We will, we will stay the same and not grow unless we start to serve. There, there's no shortcut for it. Now, when we talk about serving, we have to think of it in scriptural terms. Listen to what it says in the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verse 9. This could not be more clear. It says, let us not become weary in doing good. You know, well, that, that can happen. We, we, we start getting tired. And, and there is going too far and burning out. There's a need for balance. That's a different message. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we what? If we don't give up. Now, how many of you would be honest with me? you served in some way or you're doing some kind of a good thing and you know it's good, you know it's God's will, but you have been tempted at times to just give up. Can I see your hands? Yeah, me too. You'd be so scared if you knew all the times that I thought about giving up. <laughs> but every time now, see, I'm older and wiser. I say, oh, Randy, get that thought out of your head quick. Just think what you would have missed. Just think what you would have missed if you would have quit that time or that time or that time or that time. Um, if we do not give up, there is the temptation, therefore, to give up, to become weary in well-doing. Listen to what it, um, what, what it goes on to say. It says, therefore, as we have what? Ah, oh, you, you missed that. As we have, you, maybe you didn't like that word. Because the implication is, is that any place that needs service is an opportunity for you and I to serve. It says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So, where, where do we start serving if we want to develop in virtue, in Christ-like character development? Anywhere. Anywhere that you see a need. Anywhere that you have an opportunity. Instead of thinking like, oh man, I hope somebody else does this. Gee, I'm, I, hope, I hope I don't have to do that. We ought to be thinking, wow. I got an opportunity. I can't believe God's going to allow me to do this. And in the doing comes actual development in virtue. 
Titus focuses in on an attitudinal component that is critical in this. It says of those that are believers in Christ, while we wait for the blessed hope, and what is the blessed hope? It is the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior who, notice he's called God once again. We saw that in Philippians earlier. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, characterized by what? Eager to do what is good. Eager. He's saying they're eager to serve. There, there, there's an attitudinal component to this. Now, this is what I mentioned earlier. I, I said that, that there's a difference between serving in the spirit and serving in the flesh. You and I will grow in Christ-like character development only. You must get this only if we're serving in the spirit. And to serve in the spirit is that I am serving in fellowship with Christ. His presence is a reality inside of me. And I am doing what I do, not for any other human eye or consumption, but for him. And if I'm appreciated and recognized doing it, it's okay. And if I'm not appreciated and recognized, I don't really care. So I'm doing it for him. And when I'm serving in the spirit, I'm in a timeless zone. You, you got to get this. When we're in the spirit, we recognize we are eternal beings. I'm not concerned that I'm burning up some time that I could be using on my favorite pastime. I'm not concerned about being used or abused or, or am I being looked upon with sufficient dignity because my significance is in Christ. I know who I am. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. And I'm not worried about missing something. Oh, there's only so much time. I don't want to miss something. I'm eternal. I'm timeless when I'm in the spirit. And so I serve. And my value system is all different. I know that no matter what I do, it is more significant in the sight of God in heaven than anything that goes on at the UN or a ball field or a movie theater or any place else. I, I've got all the, this different perspective when I'm serving in the spirit. And, and I, don't really, I don't really need to watch anyone else. I want to cooperate, but, but that's all. I'm not concerned about being used or is somebody else doing their fair share and all like that. Now let's contrast that with serving in the flesh. In the scripture... There's a Greek word called sarx, and in our NIVs, it's usually translated the old sin nature. In the old King James, it was just called flesh. A little hard to differentiate between skin or this, this other inward uh, dynamic that Scripture is talking about. And when the Scripture talks about flesh or the old sin na sinful nature, it is the person that you and I were when we were just governed by our five physical senses, cut apart from God, cut off from spiritual reality, and when we were living desperately, Desperation is the natural case of a human being cut off from Christ because we don't know how long we're going to live and we want to get all the pleasure we can for as long as we can so we're, we're fear dominated, we live desperately and so our time is going to be very, very important to us because we don't know how much time we have. And so when we're serving in the flesh and this can happen to a Christian, we can get a little cranky and grumpy because we're, we're, we're always watching other people. It's like, oh, you know, why am I the only one doing this? And, and why am I spending my time doing this? And nobody else is. And nobody else seems to care. We compare with other people. We get a little grumpy. We get a little cranky. We're always thinking of what we're losing. Oh, man, I'm losing time. I could be doing something else. When you're serving in the Spirit, you're timeless. You know you're not missing anything. You've got all eternity. And it's going to be way better than anything you can get down here. When you serve in the flesh, you tend to be judgmental of others. You tend to be cranky. You tend to be always measuring. Am I being used? Am I being taken advantage of? You do what you do dutifully. Oh, well, I guess I do my duty. You know, somebody's got to do it. I guess we all pitch in. Something will get done. When we're serving in the flesh, we serve dutifully and sometimes grudgingly, but not joyfully and not spontaneously and not lovingly. And the difference is huge. It's huge. And maybe a bunch of us could, could say, yeah, you know, I know the difference. I've served sometimes in the spirit, and I've served sometimes in the flesh. And I'm just saying that some of us this morning, God's given you an opportunity to start again to serve in the spirit and not in the flesh. Discern the difference, and you'll, you'll be able to change that. Somebody came to Mother Teresa one time. She had this happen a few times through the years, giving her a bunch of grief about, you know, that old thing. Oh, why don't you teach somebody how to fish instead of, you know, giving them a fish? And they'll be better off in the long run. And she said, hey, listen, the people that I work with, they can't even hold a fishing rod. I'll feed them the fish, and then if they ever get healthy enough to stand up, you teach them how to fish. She always had an answer for everyone. But uh, 
I want to read you something else she said because I, I just think this is so important. You see, God just, he, he doesn't ask us just what are we doing. He says, why are you doing it? What, what, what's the motive inside? What's the spirit? What's the attitude in which you are doing it? Mother Teresa, she said, the poor, she insisted, deserve more than just service and dedication. If our actions are just useful actions that give no joy to the people, our poor people would never be able to rise up to the call which we want them to hear, the call to come closer to God. We want to make them feel that they are loved. When we serve in the Spirit, our attitude, our countenance, our demeanor, everything is different, and we, we communicate the warmth of Christ in what we do. When we serve in the flesh, we might get the job done, but we, we don't communicate that, that presence and that warmth of Christ. And so, if we're to grow in virtue, it is critical that we make sure we're serving in the spirit and not in the flesh. Because if we're serving the flesh, the only thing we'll grow is cranky and judgmental. That's all we'll grow in. And the joy will continue to be uh, something we find confusing and foreign. Titus 3.8 says this. It says, stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. 1 Timothy 6.18, it says, Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. You are destined and designed to serve all the time. And if you're not serving and you're a child of God, it means you're diseased, or dead. So, our God is here saying, if you're diseased, there's healing. Starts in an adi- with your attitude. If you're dead, he'll raise you back from the dead if you'll humble your heart. I want to close with um, a little excerpt from one of my favorite movies. How many of you have ever seen the movie The Princess Bride? Uh, made in 1987. Cool, cool movie. One of the best movies ever made. Very, very cool. Remember the, the key character in the thing was... Um, Buttercup, who becomes the princess. And if you remember much about the story, Buttercup was really just this peasant girl, but, you know, her family owned a farm, but she was not like a princess. She was not wealthy. She was really a peasant, but she lived in this world where she carried herself like royalty, and she was always speaking uh, derisively and, and, you know, with disrespect toward the stable boy she called Farm Boy, whose name was Wesley. You remember that? And and just to, to give you a little bit, you know, she would... Her greatest delight was in denigrating Wesley and making herself feel, you know, royal and powerful. And yet, no matter what task she gave Wesley, and no matter how rude she was to Wesley, his answer was always the same. As you wish. As you wish. As you wish. She would say, farm boy, polish my horse saddle. As you wish. Farm boy, fill these buckets with water. As you wish. Farm boy, Fetch me that pitcher as you wish. Though Buttercup is maddeningly descending, Wesley is the model servant. He never refuses her demands. And his attitude, and the attitude is key, is kind and willing. Now, the narrator, who was Peter Falk, which was kind of cool, the narrator reveals that one day Buttercup has a precious insight, an epiphany, an awakening. He reads... That day, she was amazed to discuss the same thing happened to me in the first service. Uh, this is just silly. That day, she was amazed to discover that when he was saying, as you wish, what he meant was, I love you. I don't know how else to say it, folks. I don't know where you're at. And call me a fool or a sissy, Kim did. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm in love. I, I cannot help myself. I, I had my heart vanquished uh, at age 23. I have never seen anyone as beautiful and as worthy and anyone that I trust more and more devoted to than, than King Jesus. I serve him because I love him, and I'll serve him until my last breath, and I'll serve him joyfully for eternity Um, And I hope that you'll leave here just like this, saying, Lord Jesus, as you wish. Because I love you. 
I just love you. And I can't believe I'm allowed the opportunity to express my love for you by serving you. That's enough for me, frankly. And I hope it will be for you. Let's pray. Father, help us to ask ourselves hard questions that we'll be glad we ask ourselves in the future. Are we yours? Have we, have we become your children? Have we put our faith in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ? No one can do that for us. Help us this day. If there's anyone here that's not trusted in Christ and became his follower, help, help them this day to make that eternally important decision. Father, help us each to answer that question. Are we serving you? If not, why not? And are we serving you in the spirit or in the flesh? And are we willing to change that if we're serving in the flesh? And are we willing to take the experiences and the talents and the gifts and the opportunities that you've given us and serve with passion for the rest of our days because we simply are grateful and we love you? Um, May that dynamic be created in each of us by the Holy Spirit today as we, as we sit in these moments in your presence. We ask it all, Father, in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.